Why would we spell a consonant with a K? C is Capital C is, but what does lowercase c? The speed of light. That's been used up. So yeah, we have to figure out something else. It also helps that in German, constant is spelled with a K. So we'll just pretend it's German and go with that. There we go. So now we have a mathematical way of equating pressure and temperature to each other. All we need to know is what the numerical value of K is here, and that can be determined experimentally. There you go. Let's look at another one here. This is another relationship that you should inherently know. This one is going to be pressure versus volume. I don't know about you guys, but back in the 70s when I would get vaccinated as a kid, the doctor would give me the syringe to play with afterwards. Is, do they still do that? You guys missed out. The 70s were a lot more fun. You guys are living a little bubble somewhere. It's shameful. Anyhow, so little Haas here, little five-year-old Haas, gets a vaccination. And the doctor nicely gives him a syringe to play with. Now, the doctor did take the needle off. They weren't that crazy in the 70s. But I got the syringe there. Nice syringe, no needle. Now, what I would do is I would open it up, just like I've shown here. So this is all air in here right now. I would then take a piece of paper, chew it up, get it nice and gooey, and make a spitball. And I would wad the spitball into this hole right here. Then what I would do is I would walk up to my younger brother and go like that. Slam the uh, plunger home. Let's see if we can work out what's going to happen here. If I slam this pl plunger home here, what am I doing to the volume of the gas in this syringe? I am decreasing the volume. What's going to happen to the pressure? It's going to increase. That's why the spitball flies out, hits into the eye, and he cries. That's what it's all about. So it turns out here that pressure and volume are proportional, but they are proportional as the inverse. Because as we decrease the volume, the pressure increased. Whatever we did to one of these quantities, the opposite occurs to the other. So we don't have a direct proportionality right here, we have an inverse proportionality. And we do express that by saying pressure is proportional to the inverse of volume. But we can't use this mathematically until we turn that proportionality into an equal sign. But pressure is not just equal to the inverse of volume. Just like we saw over here, there will be a constant relating these two terms. So if I went into lab and I investigated the pressure of a sample of gas at various volumes, I would find that there would be a numerical relationship between those two, a constant. And that would have to be determined experimentally. Sadly, though, it's not the same constant that we saw here. So I'm going to call this one K1. And this one's going to be K2. So two different constants of proportionality right here. All right. Now we move on to another relationship. This next one, this will be the last one we'll talk about for now. This is going to be moles versus volume. Turns out all these relationships I'm talking about up here were big, major discoveries made by important scientists of the time. Pressure versus temperature was first worked out by a guy by the last name of Charles. And so in his honor, we call this relationship between pressure and temperature Charles' Law. The relationship between pressure and volume was discovered by a guy by the name of Boyle. And so we call this relationship here between pressure and volume, Boyle's Law. The final relationship here between moles and volume was discovered by a guy whose name should be rather familiar to you, Avogadro. So this is Avogadro's Law, the relationship between moles and volume. Where have we heard the name Avogadro before? Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number. Remember, Avogadro's number is the number of molecules of something in a mole. 
It's not something we use mathematically a whole lot in chemistry, but it operates behind the scenes. It allows us to convert between grams and moles. Avogadro himself, though, had nothing to do with the discovery of Avogadro's number. That was actually named in his honor hundreds of years later. We will now, right here, see what Avogadro is actually famous for. It's one of the most earth-shattering discoveries in the entire history of science. Are you ready for this? You ready for this? You sure? Okay, here it is. This is what Avogadro discovered. This is why he's been famous for hundreds of years. This is why Avogadro's number was named after him. Here's why he was famous. Avogadro discovered the more stuff you have, the more space it takes up. I wish I was kidding. I'm not. That is Avogadro's discovery. The more stuff you have, the more space it takes up. Wow. Amazing. Science was a lot easier 500 years ago, it turns out. Ugh. I'm not even going to... I mean, that's obvious. Duh. So how would we express this in terms of our proportionality? Well, we see that moles and volume are directly proportional. So as moles goes up, volume goes up as well. As moles go down, volume goes down as well. Moles and volume are directly proportional. We can then investigate this in lab and work out an equality. So we can investigate how much volume various molar samples of gas have. And we'll find there's once again a numeric relationship between those two, given by yet another constant. But this constant is different from the other two, so we'll call this one K3. Wow. So there we have it. We have Charles' Law, Boyle's Law, and Avogadro's Law. And depending on exactly what you're looking for, you can use any of these three laws to solve for what you're looking for. Unless, do you think there's some way I could take all three of these laws, squish them together, and make a super duper law? I bet we can. Well, let's start with Charles' Law over there. So Charles' Law says pressure equals constant 1 times temperature. So, there's Charles' Law. Now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to roll Boyle's Law into that. But before I do that, Boyle's Law here is kind of sloppy. It's sloppy because fractions are a big no-no in math. No one likes fractions in math. So before we do anything else with this, let's get rid of our fraction. If we multiply both sides of this equation by volume, we would get that. And now the fraction's gone. It looks a lot cleaner that way. Now if we take Boyle's Law here in this form and roll it in over here, notice something. We already have pressure here. We just have to put volume right next to it. There. But we also have to put K2 on the other side of the equation. And there we have it. So I've just rolled Charles' Law and Boyle's Law together and made one combined gas law of those two. But I can do more. Let's roll Avogadro's Law to there as well. So here's Avogadro's Law. Notice we already have volume here. Volume's over here, so we need to put K3 on this side as well. And N will therefore have to go on the other side of the equation. And there we have it. So I've now made one combined gas law that incorporates all three of these laws simultaneously. It's kind of messy, though, because remember, each of these constants here has a definite numerical value. So rather than having three separate constants here, let's combine them all together to make one constant. We can do that by dividing both sides by K3. And we get that. I just combined all the constants together. And what we're now going to do is we're going to mathematically combine all three of these constants together and get the super duper constant that we're going to use in this chapter. That super duper constant is expressed by the variable capital R. You guys probably can't see there, so I'll put it over here. Capital R is simply those three constants combined, and turns out capital R has this numerical value. Just so it came from those three constants that were all determined experimentally, 
we've rolled them all together and made one combined constant. And there's its numerical value as determined experimentally. Our constant here has units associated with it. Those units are the rather baffling liter atmospheres per Kelvin mole. Those units don't make any rational sense whatsoever. Turns out units with constants like this are for dimensional analysis purposes. They're just to cancel out units we don't want. But they also serve an extra purpose here. Let's say you couldn't remember, for example, what unit you have to have pressure measured in. Could the units of R help you? Yes. So looking at R here, we see pressure has to be in atmospheres, volume has to be in liters, temperature has to be in Kelvin, and rather non-surprisingly, moles has to be in moles. So looking at those units there, they are there for dimensional analysis purposes, which we'll see later. They also help jog your memory as to what sorts of units all your other measurements should have. And this R here, this combined constant, is called the ideal gas law constant. And it's a very important constant in chemistry. So back to our combined super duper law over here. We can now replace these three constants with one. And we get this. Turns out chemists playfully rewrite this in a slightly different form. And we do it this way because this way we can pronounce it pervnert. This is the legendary pervnert equation. Isn't that nice? There. Now, Pervner is what we informally call it. The official name for it, though, is the ideal gas law. So this is just the, uh, the three previous laws all bundled together, and we now have what is called the ideal gas law. We would appear to have three, or sorry, we'd appear to have five variables here. Remember, R is actually a constant, and we always know what R is. So really, Pervnert has four variables. And by the rules of algebra, if we know any three of those variables, we can now solve for the fourth. This is going to be the major equation that we use in Chapter 5 for solving gas law problems. That's physics. Okay, so I know what you guys are, uh, are yearning for here. You want some math. You want to actually plug some numbers into your calculator? So let's do that. So here's a typical Pervner type gas law calculation. gas law type problem here. We're given all this information and asked what is the pressure of the gas inside the flask. This is not actually atmospheric pressure because we have gas inside a flask exerting pressure. We can measure this though in much the same way we measured atmospheric pressure. Instead of using a barometer, we would use something called a manometer in this case. But it's the same idea. We would allow the gas in this flask to press against mercury see how much mercury it can lift, and we can actually measure the pressure directly that way. But anyway, back to our Pervner calculation. As we've seen previously in this class, anytime you're given an algebraic word problem like this, it's a good idea to parse through it and determine exactly what information you're given. So reading from uh, beginning to the end here, we're told we have 0.35 moles of nitrogen here. What variable would that be? That is moles. That would be N. And notice it's in the correct unit, so we're good there. Continuing onward, we're told we have a 375 milliliter flask. 
What would that be? That is volume. However, that's not the correct units for our volume here because our volume has to be in liters. So you can use dimensional analysis or just recognize that since there's a thousand milliliters in a liter, this would be 0.375 liters. And now we have our volume in the correct units. Yes, Thomas? It says, since it's in a sealed glass, does it have to assume that it's full? Yes. Okay. Yep. So yeah, so we'll assume the entire flask is taken up by the gas. And hopefully that was accounted for here. Next, we have at a temperature of 22 degrees C. So that would be temperature. But that temperature has to be in Kelvin. So we got to make sure we convert that to Kelvin. You'll do that by adding 273.15 to it. Let's so figure that out. There. So that'd be about 295 Kelvin. And finally, what is the pressure inside the flask? So P is what we're actually looking for. And notice we can solve this problem because our ideal gas law over here again has four variables. If we know any three of them, we can solve for that missing four. So we're good to go here. We'll use Perkner. But another good rule for algebra word problems like this is don't just haphazardly plug these numbers in now. You'd be well advised to solve this algebraically for the variable you're looking for first before you plug in your numbers. Since we're looking for pressure, I'll divide each side of this equation by volume, and now I get this. So always do that first, and then now you can plug your numbers in. significant figure should I have here? Only two. Notice what limits us here is the number of moles. That only had two sig figs. And so it looks like our answer here is 23. No, we'll talk about that in a second. So our answer should have two significant figures here. What's the units for our answer? ATMs. And we know that because that's just a consequence of the ideal gas law. Pressure is in ATMs. But we also know that through dimensional analysis. Remember, that's the real reason that R has the weird units it has. Notice that 